appreciation for serving in. And Scott also played for Mark Henschel's Memorial Service Friday, so we appreciate uh, that as well. And uh, the flowers you see up here are from our service of celebration of his life and faith and new and eternal life with the Lord. And Pastor, we continue to keep you and the family in our, in our prayers for comfort and, and peace. Uh, we have a, a visitor here, uh, Margie Meyer, just shared that her aunt passed away, so I want to include them in our prayers for comfort today, our Aunt Mildred. And also we've been praying for uh, several weeks for a good family friend of uh, Robin and Sandra Long, Evan Duncan, he was just 16 years old, uh, passed away from that battle of cancer, so I want to lift them up in our prayers for comfort as well. We did have uh, Ken Simon was here last week and played and uh, met with our team and sat in on the day at school and uh, was pretty much a consensus from the council and school board and, and our uh, search team that uh, it was all positive comments uh, for, to encourage Ken. So I talked to him yesterday and said we're going to send him a contract and like ask, ask him to uh, come be on part of our church ministry staff and learn and grow with us so uh, he will be praying about that and uh, so we lift, we'll lift him up in our prayers uh, today too as he considers uh, that job offer as, as well uh, Val Reed also is going to be going to see a specialist she's uh, one of our members resident out at Concordia Life Care and, uh, but she's been dealing with some blood loss and Go see a, an intern, internist uh, this week. So I just pray for wisdom for, for them. Uh, we will have our Wednesday midweek service at, at 12 uh, 15. My dad's going to share the message on uh, by, by faith, not by works. As, as you see in our bulletin here, both on the Wednesdays and Sunday mornings, we're looking at this theme of the gospel of, of grace. And today we're going to talk about how the the devil tries to entrap and ensnare us and pull us away from the real true gospel message and, and how we need to be wary of that. So let's uh, invite you to stand. We're going to open with a soul fire song, uh, Walk by Faith.
gospel of grace, we make our beginning this Lord's Day in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I invite you to be seated, or you can kneel, you can use a kneeler if you'd like to kneel, and take a moment in personal time of reflection and confession, and then we'll speak together our corporate words of confession. Father, I, poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death, of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May be seated. We hear our first two readings for the second Sunday in Lent. Our first reading is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 17 Abraham and the Covenant of Circumcision. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, that your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you, throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant, to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abram, As for Sarah, your wife, you shall no, not call her name Sarah, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of people shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the second reading, it's found in the book of Galatians, when Paul opposes Peter. But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. 
But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were bound to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law I died to the law, so that I might live to God. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. This is the word of the law. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Louise. Please stand as we hear this morning's gospel and then make our confession of faith this morning. And the Holy Gospel chosen for this morning is Mark chapter 8, verses 27 to 38. You can find that on page 844 in your pew Bible. This is where Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ. And Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they told him, John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed. And after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly, and Peter, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake in the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And together we join in confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in one Lord, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, be God not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. 
and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. We're going to have the children's message. Myra will be sharing that for the folks worshiping in person here. If you haven't yet filled out our Connect cards, go ahead and tear those out of the bulletin, and you can drop those in the offering plates as you leave this morning. Myra? Okay, and today we're going to, for our children's message, we're going to share a little game. We're going to do a Who Am I game. So I'm going to share with you some clues and uh, see if you can discover who this biblical person is from the clues that you've heard. So we'll see how well you guys are familiar with some of these characters. So here's the first one in the first person. First clue, I was a tax collector. I cheated people out of money. I was very short. You might find me up in a tree. Who do you think that was? Any of you guys around? I heard Zacchaeus. Yeah, Zacchaeus. The wee little man who climbed up in the sycamore tree. Okay, here's another one. This shouldn't be too hard. You'd be able to figure this one out pretty well. I was a very young girl. I was pledged to marry a carpenter. An angel came and told me I would have a special baby. Who do you think that was? You guys have an idea? Who is that? Mary. Yeah, Mary. Okay, one more. I wore unusual clothes. I enjoyed bugs and honey for dinner. <laughs> that might be a dead giveaway there, right? My favorite word is repent. Who do you think that person is in the Bible? John the Baptist. Yeah, John the Baptist, who liked to wear the, uh, the unusual clothes and have the, uh, the locusts and honey was one of his meals. So who am I? We have a lot of different people in the Bible that we wonder who they are, but in our gospel reading, if you listen to our gospel reading, Jesus was kind of playing that game with the disciples. When they were traveling together, Jesus said, who do people say I am? Who am I? He wanted to, to, to ask the disciples who they thought he was or what people, different people said. And what did different people say? They say, well, we think he might be Elijah to come back or a prophet come back to be uh, to, to share with us God's word again. And who was one of the other ones they said was John the Baptist. So these are different things that people thought about who Jesus was. And then he said, but you, you guys who have been around me, who do you say I am? And what did they say? Peter is the one who said, you are Christ, the son of God. You are the Christ. That's what Peter said. And he said, and Jesus said to him, it wasn't uh, just by your own understanding that you said that. My father gave you those words. My father helped you to know that. And God helped him to know by the Holy Spirit who he was as a son of God. You know, it's a wonderful thing. We get a chance to see Jesus and we know Jesus, right? We know him as someone that God sent to be a baby in a manger, to uh, come to this earth to do many miracles, but to die and rise again. And we know that Jesus is the son of God who came to be our savior. But the interesting thing is a lot of people don't know that. They think, well, he's a good teacher, he's a, he's a good religious man, but they maybe don't see him as Savior. And it's our job in this world to help people know who Jesus is. So that when they say, who is Jesus? We can say, he is God's Son, our Savior, sent to save us from sin, death, and the devil, and to give us eternal life forever. And hopefully God can help all of us, young or small, be able to tell the world, really, who Jesus is. And let's do that now and ask God to help us by praying together. Would you join me in a prayer? Dear Jesus. Dear Jesus. We know who you are. We know who you are. You are God's only son. You are God's only son. The Savior of the world. The Savior of the world. Help us to let others know. Help us to let others know. That you are Christ. Christ. The one who came to save them too. The one who came to save them too. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Jesus, we pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. All right, and I will hand out some handouts, and if you need one, I'll just come around and just raise your hand. Thank you, Myron. And our hymn of the day is hymn 566, By Grace I'm Saved.
peace that comes with that gift of grace through faith. May that fill our hearts and minds today. You know, as a pastor, a Lutheran pastor in a relatively big city, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, I'm not sure that I'll ever have to trap my own food to save myself being lost in the wilderness, but I love those shows uh, about that. One of my favorite was Bear Gorilla shows where, you know, ever seen, he gets dropped off in the wilderness somewhere, and he has to journey for a couple of days and find water and find food to eat. And so uh, getting ready for this message, I just got, jumped on the internet and did a search for uh, how to trap food for survival. And one of the sites that came up, here was the heading uh, of the article. It said, Tangle, Strangle, and Mangle. <laughs> how to catch food, basically, to survive. And, and it had to do with something like this, at least a couple of them did, uh, a snare. And so I, I brought a little sheep here to represent you and me, by the way, and all the Lord is my shepherd, we are the sheep. But, so the tangle was some of the snares are made to you know, catch an animal by the, by the leg, and then they're tangled up and they can't get away, and then hopefully you find some lunch. Well, the strangle, as you can imagine, it doesn't catch them by the leg, catches them around the, the neck there, and, and that little lamb's not going to last too long there. And I have to tell you, the mangle has to do with something called a deadfall, <laughs> which you can sort of imagine that in your mind. If you can't, it, it means you set up a trap where some big heavy stone or something else heavy falls and crushes uh, your, the prey, or, or your, hopefully your, your lunch. And I thought, boy, that's actually a pretty good description of what the devil wants to do to us as Christians, too. At a minimum, to tangle us up so we can't really follow the Good Shepherd. He would probably like to strangle the faith in our hearts and in our minds. And really, if it was up, up to him to completely mangle that and destroy that so that we would die not just a physical death, but an eternal death to be condemned to hell as, as he was for rebelling against God. And, and in our uh, Lutheran study Bible, the little chart that I put uh, on, on the sermon notes here, that, that was from, a, from the book of Galatians section in the, in the study Bible. We talked about how Satan uses some distorted versions of Christianity, which actually end up not really being Christianity at all, to try to do just that, to try to snare us, to entrap us, and to pull us away and lead us away from the one who is the resurrection and the life, and to lead us to our demise and, and to our death. And so, uh, in the study Bible there, it compares true Christianity and its message to some false Christianities. Judaized Christianity, legalistic Christianity, and lawless Christianity. And uh, in the little chart there, too, I didn't put it all in there. I didn't want to fit in the sermon notes there, but it talked about... Now, there's some, some well-intentioned things uh, behind some of these, but ultimately, they end up really leading us away from the idea of grace. That we are saved as a gift, not based on anything you and I have done, but by we are saved as a gift of all that Christ has done and as one for us. So I wanted to read a little portion of the, the study Bible notes there, and it said, legalism then and now. It's important to understand the problem of legalism in, Christ, in the church, then, you know, in the days of the church in Galatia, but also now, and to distinguish it from the gospel and Christian freedom. Goes on and says, outside of biblical Christianity, other religions or philosophies have one thing in common. They teach that we must somehow save ourselves. And that's key. We must somehow save ourselves. Such salvation is sometimes viewed as a future paradise. Sometimes it simply means bettering this present world. Either way, it's up to us to achieve it. You know, I thought about bringing out a big ladder and having it here and saying, well, that's what they say. Well, like, somehow you have to do what you do and that get to climb up a rung, you know, and in some of the philosophies, 
they recognize that we can't do that even in one lifetime. So you got to be reincarnated and come back so you can hopefully get a little closer to nirvana or a little closer to paradise or somehow earn our ways into heaven. But we just sang it, didn't we? By grace, I'm saved. It comes to us as a gift. And Paul was dealing with some, one of these sort of false Christianities, Judaized Christianity, and even Peter, the, the Peter who, who proclaimed, you are the Christ, got wrapped up in that too. So let me give you the description of, of this uh, false Christianity, Judaized Christianity. Basically, uh, it said, this is the description, Christians are Jews who recognize Jesus as the promised Savior, but any Gentile desiring to be become a Christian must first become a Jew or become like a Jew. And we see that in the epistle reading for today. So it says Peter is there, and he was eating with the Gentiles, which probably meant he was eating not kosher food. And then it says some of those who follow the way of the circumcision, because remember, when God made his covenant with Abraham, the sign of the covenant was all the males were to be circumcised. Well, basically there was these Jewish people, Jewish by birth and by blood, who became believers in Christ. But then they said, well, you know, you, you Greeks and you other Gentiles, if you want to be a real Christian, a real follower of Jesus, you have to be circumcised like us. And you have to follow all of our traditions and customs as well. And sort of on a good side of this, you can say, well, if one thing is it's very good to remember that God did choose Israel. You know, the Jewish people were his chosen people through which this promised Messiah, the Christ, as we heard in the Gospel reading, would come. And you remember who else was Jew? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, right? Born of the Virgin Mary, we said, but conceived by the Holy Spirit. So the Son of God becomes Son of Man, one of us, as a fulfillment of that promise through Father Abraham. But Peter was getting all wrapped up in that. He was afraid that the, the Jewish Christians would, would ridicule him. And they said, no, I'm not going to hang out with them. And he kind of separated himself from them. And he was kind of more on the outward appearances and traditions. And this, see, this is the real danger here, is when the traditions get elevated above the Word of God then there's problems. And whenever I think about that word tradition, guess what song immediately pops into my mind? Probably yours too, from Fiddler on the Roof, right? Tradition, tradition. You know, and Tevye, the, the main character in there, uh, in, the, in the midst of that song, he stops and he's dialoguing and the, the refrain's going on, tradition, tradition. And here's what, here's what Tevye says. I think it kind of picks up on here of, of sort of the problem of lifting up even tradition over the very word of God itself. So Tevyev says, because of our traditions, we've kept our balance for many, many years. Here in Anatevka, we have traditions for everything, how to sleep, how to eat, how to work, how to wear clothes. For instance, we always keep our heads covered. We always wear a little prayer shawl. This shows our constant devotion to God. You may ask, how did this tradition get started? He says, I will tell you. I do not know. <laughs> but he says it's tradition. And because of our traditions, every one of us knows who he is and what God expects him to do. So I want to say there's nothing wrong with traditions. We have traditions, you know, we, in the Lutheran church, we have our traditions too. But if tradition ever pulls away or goes contrary to the Word of God, if tradition ever says somehow you can save yourself, Boy, you know what we heard today? Louise read it and says, then, then why did Jesus have to die? But he did have to die. Because the truth is, tradition doesn't save us. Jesus saves us. The other trouble that can come is called legalistic Christianity. And here it's basically, uh, this happens pretty prevalent today too. Some Christians say, well, I have this long list of things you have to do. And or I actually made it to a longer list of don'ts. If you're a real Christian, you can't do this. And probably one of the most 
famous ones is to drink alcohol. You know, some Christians say, well, no, you can't drink alcohol, and if you do that, then you're not really a Christian. Because, you know, in the Bible, it does speak against getting drunk on alcohol, but it doesn't really prohibit drinking alcohol. And so all of a sudden, it's the rules, following the rules, that become more important than the Redeemer. It's almost like not just a few rules either. It's sort of like, I said, okay, ah, here's my list of rules for you. That's why this is called legalistic Christianity. You, this is, you have to do it this way, you have to sing this way, you have to worship this way, you have to dress this way, otherwise you're not a real Christian like me, right? No. No. Now here, again, on the positive, the positive of that is, it's recognizing, yes, when we become a believer in Jesus, it should change us should change our behavior, but not in a legalistic way of saying, you have to do this way or worship this way in order to get in good with God. Instead, following God and following the laws of God should flow out of the heart of thankfulness for that gift of grace and for all that God has done for us. And so this is the danger, though, where the rules, again, become more important and outweigh the Redeemer and what He has done for us. And what happens then is with either of these, they're both kind of, one just has taken the Old Testament law, one says, now it's the laws that we make, and what does it do? It ensnares us, it traps us, and pulls us away from that true gospel, the teaching of grace. And really, legalism, whether it's Judaized Christianity or legalistic Christianity, it can lead really to two things. On the one hand, it can lead to pride. You know, like, hey, look at me. Remember when Jesus told about this? In the temple, there was the Pharisee, and then there was the tax collector, and the tax collector was very humble and recognized he was a sinner, and the, and the Pharisee was like, oh, I thank God I'm not like that guy over there. He's really bad. You know, but I'm like a super tither, and super worshiper and all this, you know, he, was, I think he threw his shoulder out trying to pat himself on the, on the back. So that pride in what we do, again, Satan can use that to try to tangle us up, trip us up. But also, I can put this on my other hand here, it can lead to despair, to think that we have to earn our way to heaven. And, and to me, this is sort of the stranglehold that Luther felt before he discovered grace, before he read passages like we heard today, before he discovered the gift of God given in and through Christ and that becomes ours through faith. You see, because Luther basically realized this, because the church of the day was saying, yeah, Jesus did this, but you still have to do your works. You have to add on to them and kind of finish off and complete the work. That, that Christ didn't quite finish. And Luther, as he you know, wrestled with that, and it really kind of, the devil wanted to strangle that trust in Christ out of him. He basically thought and said, if even the smallest part of my salvation is dependent on me and my works, then he said, I'm lost. And truly, that leads to despair. But the gospel breaks through. It says, no, it's not about what you and I do. It's about what Christ has already done for us. Now, there's another type of Christianity that they describe in the study Bible. There's a lawless Christianity. And again, that's a pretty popular one in our world today. And it's basically this. I don't need the law of God to tell me what's right and true. I will just base that on what I feel is right and true, right? Sort of like, I'm above the law, I don't really need the Ten Commandments, I can decide, and you know, it's, you hear it in phrases like, you do you, and I'll do me, or you have your truth, and I have my truth, but the reality is, if you can have your truth, and you can have your truth, and I can have my truth, there's really no truth at all. But the Word of God is true, and Jesus Christ is that Word of God, who came into the flesh to show us how salvation would be won. 
He laid down his life for you. He laid down his life for me. And that, that is the real gospel. And, you know, our sinful nature doesn't like to admit that we need help. <laughs> so that's the real danger there, to think somehow I'm, a, I'm above the law and, and I can just do what I feel is right. But God has given us his word. He's given us the law on purpose. And I'm sure you've probably heard this before, you know, that, that scriptures can kind of be divided into two real big teachings. The law, and it has its function, and the gospel, and it has its function and role to do too. And they can be described with these letters, S-O-S. -S. On the one hand, the law is meant to show us our sin, or our sickness, we could say, our spiritual sickness. The gospel is meant to show us our Savior. And problems happen when you try to mix the two up. And if you think, well, you can somehow save yourself by keeping the law. That's what really all of these false Christianities are about. And I wanted to share this. This is one of the books that we uh, had at, when I was at seminary. In fact, we had a, a whole course for a whole semester on law and gospel. And uh, this book was written by the first president of our Synod, C.F.W. Walter, and it's called Law and Gospel. We just call it Law and Gospel for short. But here's the full title. The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel. Sometimes as sinners, we need to hear the law. We need to have that mirror of the law held up so we can see that we're sick. But the law doesn't have an answer for my sins and your sins because I can't keep the law perfectly, neither can you. Only Jesus could. And only Jesus did. And that's where the gospel comes in. He alone is the way and the truth and the life. He alone is the Savior, the Messiah, as Peter confessed. And in some ways it made me think a little bit like, since we're in the midst of this COVID time here, you know, I can go get a COVID test. And it can say, yes, you have, you know, COVID. No, you don't. It can diagnose, but it can't fix, can't heal me if I do have it. It just tells me whether or not I do. In many ways, that's what the law of God does. It says, except in this case, there's no, there's no, maybe you have it, maybe you don't. The law shows us that every one of us carries that sickness of sin, and it's lethal. Not just physically, but spiritually too. And then we need the antidote to that sickness. And that's the gospel message of Jesus Christ. That's the wonderful, sweet gospel of grace. And how, what an awesome gift it is to us. That's where real, true Christianity is. And, and this is uh, the way they described it in the, in the Lutheran Bible there. I want to read this for you from the study notes. It says, Christians are those who believe that Jesus' death has allowed God to freely give them forgiveness and eternal life. They have that gift through faith, by the power of God's Spirit, through word and sacrament. And so we've heard the word of God today, and just a little bit we're going to receive the blessed sacrament of Holy Communion, you know, where he gives us himself for that gift of forgiveness and to strengthen our faith. But I want you to read with me, will you? Let's read our, this verse from our epistle reading today, Galatians 2.16, because it really describes... The, the true gospel message, the, the true source of Christianity, grace, and which becomes ours through faith. <clears throat> Excuse me, let's read that together. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. Yeah, and, and Paul writes in, in Romans 2, he says this, and I'm gonna, he uses the word yoke, you know, which was the, the crossbar that was put on oxen, and they were yoked, and, and I'm just gonna use the, the little snare here as I read this verse. This is in Galatians, Chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. He says, Don't allow yourself to be ensnared by a false gospel, a false Christianity, because Jesus truly is the only one 
who through grace sets us free. And he offers it to us, salvation, full and free in Christ Jesus. Amen. And may that peace, that peace that surpasses all of our human understanding, may it guard and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand with me and we will prepare our hearts to come to the Lord's table now. Uh, again, I want to thank you for your tithes and offerings, your prayers of support for our mission and ministry. And um, as we have the privilege to receive Christ and his word and the, and the blessing of this sacrament, we hear now his words to us. After the words of institution, you can be seated and we're going to sing, Let Us Ever uh, Walk With Jesus. Andy and I will commune each other, and then we welcome you to the Lord's table, and we'll do that in continuous fashion again this morning, and you can put your individual cups in the, in the baskets there. <clears throat> In the wonder and in the miracle of this sacrament, our Lord and Savior, Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, gives to us his true body and his true blood, not only to give us that gift of the forgiveness of our sins, but also to strengthen us in that journey of faith. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And may that peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with Let Us Ever Walk With Jesus.
in that true faith to life everlasting. Go in that peace and joy of the Lord. Amen. We come to him now with our prayer needs. After the individual uh, prayer of the day and the petitions, we will also pray together the, the Lord's Prayer. But let's join in our prayer of the day. O oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Indeed, Lord, you have freely given us the gifts of grace, the forgiveness of sins, and life and salvation. Lord, as our Redeemer, may the victory that you have won over sin, death, and the devil give special comfort to our church families who have lost loved ones. May you be with Pastor and Shirley, with Taylor and Sam, and Paul and Johnny, and the rest of the Henschel family, as they both mourn and yet celebrate his homecoming. May that same comfort and peace uh, be with the families of David and Renita's friends, Craig and Sam. We echo those prayers for the family of Asa and Catherine Douglas, who died in the past months from COVID, and also lifting up the Duncan family as they mourn the death of their child, uh, Evan. We pray too, Heavenly Father, that uh, you would put your hand of healing and strength upon those who uh, are facing illness or disease or recovering from surgeries or awaiting them. Be with Val Reed as she meets with her GI doctor this week that they can determine the uh, cause of her loss of blood and to give her that renewed health and strength. I also pray that you would be with uh, my cousin Neil and his wife Sarah as she's been diagnosed with breast and lymph node cancer. We echo those prayers for Kathy and for Greta, for Chanel and Ruth, for Kim and Hugh's sister Cheryl, for uh, Jeannie's sister Vicki and others who are battling cancer. Father, in our prayers of rejoicing, uh, thank you for the gift of life to, to my niece Laura and her husband Ben as they were blessed with the birth of their son, Charles Gabriel, last week. We also pray, Heavenly Father, that uh, by your spirit, you would guide Ken Simon as he considers our offer to come be a part of our ministry team here uh, as our director of music and music teacher for our school ministry. For these and all the other wonderful blessings you pour into our hearts and to our lives each day, Lord, we give you thanks and praise as together we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. Amen. In our closing song, uh, led by soul fire, is oceans or where feet may fall.
know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And so we go forth to celebrate and share Christ's love, hope, and peace with all people. Go in that peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.